Well, Mr. Rowe, it's Rowan from Silver Tiger Media, and what a genuine privilege and honour it is to speak with you. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, look, it's my pleasure, especially on a day like uh, is coming up on Saturday for us. Oh, absolutely. So we uh, prepare to, to remember all of those who have given so much for our freedom at the moment, but uh, particularly in this moment in history for so many reasons. But first of all, how are you going with the current arrangements in our, our lives of lockdown, as it were? Well, I can't believe that people are complaining because mm. we were called up <laughs> at, at the prime of our lives when we were 20 years old, called up into the army. We were be, we were paid 55 bucks a week, and if we went overseas, that would be tax-free uh, <laughs> to be shot at, and mm. it lasted for two years. So, you know, our life has already been disrupted um, once, and, and we know we came through it. We know, I really think that personally that the country is going to be better off for it. I know it's hurting a lot of people, and I don't want to belittle that, uh, that pain, but I think we're all going to realise that, you know, we're not just um, islands. Mm. Uh, no man is an island, as, as the proverb goes, but I think that we can be a, a hell of a lot more um, charitable towards each other uh, when we start to realise what we've been able to achieve through all this. I agree wholeheartedly, but then I'm a big advocate of Nashos as well and having that community spirit as a result. But if I could set the scene a little more for people there, Norma, it's not to put too fine a point on it, but unlike 1965, for, for all of those who are pissing and moaning, or even back to our original advisors in 1962 onwards, when our first conscripts, as it were, landed in Vietnam, we're not being told to go off and fight experts in guerrilla warfare on their own turf in the Viet Cong, nor battle the NVA. We're being asked to sit at home quietly and watch TV. Now, you were a superstar with 11 top 10 records, 13 hits, singles. By 1965, you're Australia's most popular performer, performed in the UK for a couple of years, a little bit of time in training. Then the next moment, you're standing at a roadblock with your APCs outside of New Edap, with your sidearm to the head of a South Vietnamese man. Now, if that's not the most significant of culture shocks, I don't know what is. Is that a fairly apt portrayal of what it was like and how quickly this happened? Well, I would say that's a that's a very good pricey of it, and uh, um, and that moment was uh, was a, a very very um, sobering moment for me because I I looked at this young man. He had tried to get through it, and, and I was just trying to, you know, it was for his own good because we had engineers um, looking for mines on that section of the road, and we didn't want anybody to ride their push bike down and get blown up. Mm. But I, I looked at my at this young man, I looked at my, my pistol, and I thought, what have I turned into? And it, and it really did have a, a marked effect on the rest of my tour of duty and, and on my life ever since, too. Absolutely. That, that, that is a, a poignant moment, but you did what you were trained to do, of course. You trained at Kapuka, um, I'm presuming, and passed out at Pakapunyal. No, uh, I, I, tra I trained at Pakapunyal for six months. I, I did the recruit training and then, then of course, uh, the core training for Armoured Corps was at the Armoured Centre in Pakapunyal as well. So went through the summer and the winter. <laughs> oh, goodness me, at Buckapunyal, dear, oh, dear. Was that actually a choice to be able to go into an armoured division? Uh, look, you were asked to give your preferences. They were preferences only. Uh, and only two of us from our 60-member platoon actually went into uh, uh, into um, Armoured Corps. Uh, and then uh, we both decided on our course, we, there's no point in being in the army if we didn't do what we were being trained for, what a waste of time that was. So we mm. put down for uh, uh, for uh, the, the particular unit that was uh, standing there ready to go to Vietnam and, of course, uh, the rest is history. Indeed. And, of course, one thing that I've always wondered about that time, and I mean this with the greatest of respect, Normie, how were you treated when you were conscripted, particularly in uh, training? Because... The February of 1968, you, you were well known. 
certainly not a successful singles. And also enjoying that uh, UK time with the Playboys uh, and straight into the Green Machine. How were you received in the art? Well, um, I'll put it in the words of Max Knight, who uh, served with the 9th Battalion, that he was in our training platoon. And uh, we went on our first leave out of Pakapanyal uh, after about uh, a couple, oh, six weeks or something uh, and went down to my place. And he had his family was way out in the bush somewhere in Western Victoria. And um, he... Uh, he, he came down with us and he was just telling mum, he said, oh, I was going to give that young pop, that that pop singer what for, I was going to give him a biffin, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and he said, he said, by the by the time we were into it for two or three weeks, our backsides, he didn't say backsides, but our backsides mm. were hanging out so much that by the time I had time to actually do this, I found out he was a good bloke. <laughs> and you know, in many, every now and then in my life, those two words come up. Oh, he's a good bloke, and I, I take that as a badge of honour. Um, is my my dad was was uh, he was like I reckon he was the character that Alwyn Kurtz played in the last of the Australians, yeah. and uh, because dad dad was uh, you know bloody dagos and bloody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, day this and I, was, and I said, Dad, I, I, that's right. There was a car up in the road and and it, it didn't do what he was expecting it to do. He said, Oh, bloody day go. I said, Dad, how do you know he was an Italian? He said, Oh, the, the way to drive. And I said, I said, Really? What have you got against? Oh, well, they come to Australia and uh, they. Um, it was, I said, Your family came to Australia. It might have been four, four generations ago, but they <laughs> came. And and he he said, oh yeah, and they they take our women, and I said, well you've got a woman, uh, how many do you need? I mean, surely <laughs> mum is enough for you. <laughs> and he said, oh, and they take our jobs, and I said, Dad, you just finished your day job. I'm dropping you off to work for your night job. How many jobs do you need? <laughs> and he said, oh well, yeah, it's all. And I said to him, well, what about Tony Antonio at work? The one that at, at all the socials that work puts on uh, at Peerless Emulsions. Do you think? Uh, do, what do you think of him? He, you know, he loves to play the trumpet, and he's a. Re he said, "Oh yeah, but he's a good bloke." <laughs> <laughs> and, oh. I, and I and I thought, you know, maybe the the rule of thumb isn't colour. A creed, race, whatever. Maybe it's whether or not you're a good bloke. Oh, absolutely I... agreed. And of course, we, uh, as we were talking about before off recording, I won't go into specifics, but uh, we miss those. Oh, it's, uh, uh, those colourful, humorous, uh, mutually respectful, I think, irreverent days of terms like Jimmy Grant uh, for anyone who wasn't necessarily Australian. In their well, eyes. isn't it funny? You know, when. when um, uh, Oh, 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 what's his name from MasterChef? Um, the bald one, the, the, uh, the Greek guy. Um, yep. <laughs> anyway, when he opened his restaurants, he called them Jimmy Grants. Yes. And I had never heard that that uh, concept. There we go. Never heard. I've never heard that term. Uh, so it's <laughs> so it was, it was really funny. It was, then when it was explained to me, I just thought, isn't it funny how? It can, uh, George uh, Colin Burris. Anyway, isn't it funny how something that may have been used as a slight on somebody now becomes a commercial enterprise and, exactly. and used as a, as a positive? It's it's fantastic, you know. Uh, it's, it's absolutely surreal, and uh, of course, if we're going back to, to arriving in country just for a moment, Normie, if, if I could, I, I guess. Our, our most celebrated portrayal of events and how our culture fit into the war in Vietnam would have to be the, the, the movie The Odd Angry Shot. I realise that was specifically following characters from uh, the regiment, the, the Special Air Service. But how close was that film to, to arriving in Vietnam as Australians, particularly touching down in places like Vong Tau or, or specifically New Da? Well, Graham Kennedy could never have been in SAS. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, and and I loved I loved the man. I thought you know I knew him, 
And yeah. I loved him. I thought he was marvellous. But it was, you know, I mean, it might have been put in for light comic relief, but any of those actors could have taken his lines. Um, <laughs> but no. And, and I, I worked quite a lot with the SAS guys to extracting them from from jungle situations and that, and they were unbelievable. They were they were just like they called them the I think they called them the the phantoms of the jungle, mm. and and they they just disappeared. We'd we'd take them into an area and and we'd be driving along. Uh, the ramp would go down at the back of the armoured personnel carrier. The driver would drop the ramp, and we continue driving. I'd look around, and they were gone. They were mm. gone. It was, you know, amazing people. So, as far as the, that, oh, but the story was a bit the same, and the same with Stone. But we weren't, we were still quite inept at making movies in those times. Mm. Um, the soundtrack was good because I sang the song for it. But, yes, indeed. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I really think the the real hallmark of Australian war movie making has to be. Close Encounters, uh, close, um, uh, Danger Close, yes. uh, the story of uh, Long Tan. And I cannot believe how the film industry ignored it at any of the awards programs because I think it, it stands out as being a world-class mo- movie of, of uh, a, a real historic importance because I think they took a lot of notice of the people who were guiding them through the accuracy Mm. I mean, there are certain things that you, you couldn't you couldn't feel a whole field a whole uh, uh, squadron of armoured personnel carriers, but uh, mm. um, you know it it was uh, it was fantastic, and the story the story was just uh, was so accurate, I think. Indeed, uh, particularly around Long Tan and uh, the, the battle specifically that needs to be remembered uh, to honour those that were there and gave so much and still continue to give so much in their their current lives which leads me back to the concept of, of talking about you as a good bloke I, I, without catering to to your personal vanity the fact is to, to be able to speak to you is an honor and but how much you have done for people since you came back um, it, it, it's just remarkable I think good bloke doesn't uh, doesn't even touch on it well, I, do. I, I do if you can aspire to be a good bloke I reckon you you've got you've got a good uh, journey to take oh so. absolutely and around that time, I mean, in, in re- returning home, thinking about this period of time is when I feel on occasion very ashamed of how our heroes were received back again. What was your experience in returning? Well, it was uh, the first thing that happened is, uh, you know, my mum, mum was excited to see me, obviously. Mm. Dad said, well, now the best thing you can do, mate, is just to forget you ever went. Don't think about it ever again. Uh, and you'll be right. And uh, as much as I love my dad, um, I, his advice was probably the worst advice that anybody could have been given in that situation, mainly because the last thing we needed to, to be doing is shutting it down and forgetting the incidents. And when, when I think about some of the, the mates that I lost um, and that I, uh, uh, you know, I... I how could I ever forget them and, and the situation in which they they lost their lives? How could I ever Absolutely. forget them? Absolutely, yeah. It's just an uh, impossible thing. Most certainly. And uh, to, I, I must mention as well, too, I, I was speaking to John Jarrett recently while we were talking about I, I think uh, yes. shot and, um he, he was kind enough to repeat one line back from the movie for me, which was, geez, I'd love a passiona, which just... It gave to me that, that Aussie culture bridging the gap to what people were doing over in Vietnam. But the, the return uh, for so many people was indeed horrific and still continues to be. So, again, how much you uh, have done to, uh, to to help those people find a way forward is just, just so valuable. Uh, as is, of course, to hear you and watch you singing the song Compulsory Hero. It, it's so special indeed. To, to those of us who honour your service by teaching our children to those who were there and still live with the scars of war. The song and the video is so very special. Normie, what does that song mean to you? Well, I have trouble singing songs that don't mean something important to me. Um, and, you know, I mean, even to the point of shaking all over, to me, it, it reminds me of how what I was like when I first 
started singing that song back in the 19, early 1960s. Um, and I was a huge fan of Johnny Chester's. Uh, to go on stage and sing that song with the Thunderbirds <laughs> who recorded the backings for it was, to me, was just like I'd died and gone to heaven. Mm. And so every time I sing a song, it has to mean something. And when the, the lyrics of this um, presented themselves to me, I was reading through, I always read the story before I actually start learning the, the melody or anything. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, this is not just my story. It is my story, but it's not just mine. It's a story of 50,000 other young Australian men who were dragged out of their everyday life. Uh, some of them didn't mind. Uh, others, you know, they had a career path and a life all set in front of them and a good and healthy one that their brothers and sisters uh, were able to continue on. And then the, the government was going to say, oh, nobody is going to miss out by going over. Well, you know, bad luck about that because everybody who who went, was called into the army missed two years of their life. So that was rubbish. Mm. Uh, and, I, you know, to me, I sang it uh, as if I was... Um, as if I was any one of those 50,000 young Australian men who were dragged out of their day-to-day -day, uh, ambitions and dreams. While you're speaking, Normie, I cannot help but think of you in one light, holding a guitar, singing on stage, and then sitting in an M113 in the middle of a jungle. It's, um, it, it really is um, such a, it's an incredible thought that you've gone from one life to the next. In 1970, you released Hello, the, the, the title song uh, written by Johnny Young, and that was essentially the, the end of your, your contract with Sunshine Records. Uh, but what I wonder is how music had changed for you after your service. Well, I, I was... I reckon by the time I got back from England, I went to England in 66 uh, and came back mid-67. And by the time I'd been blooded through all of that sort of stuff and had to step up to the plate to, to match it with the very experienced uh, um, British bands and singers. Uh, we toured with some amazing people, the Trogs and the and who were having monster hits with Wild Thing and all that stuff at the time. And uh, the Small Faces um, got on very well with young Stevie Marriott. Um, and uh, uh, toured with Gene Pitney. The, all, all of that sort of experiences you had to step up to the plate you know had to really sort of balance the show and by the time I got back I was probably two years ahead of where I might have been anyway so when uh, when I got back from the army it seemed to me all I had to do was continue what I was doing and I so sort of, but the music industry had moved on of course and uh, and and to be honest after being in a war and seeing people suffer so badly because just because they were in a war, uh, to me, I, just living the life of a self-ingratiating pop star, I, I I couldn't do with with any sort of honesty, and and I just I just felt bad about it anyway. So it took me a, six months to realise the only thing I knew anything about was the was music and the music industry. So when I was approached by Ethel Guy of the Seekers and uh, John Ashby who was the Seekers tour manager uh, and they said now what are you doing uh, I just said uh, I said nothing and they they took over my management and and guided me to the next sort of 25 years of my life working in cabaret in uh, in clubs in Sydney Wow that is so significant because another song of course uh, Johnny Young wrote was um, Smiley which was a hit for Ronnie Burns and I understand that the track was apparently about you is that right? Yeah that's right I had no idea until about 90, 1994 something like that and I was on radio uh, in Sydney and I, I was speaking to, to John um, in the studio and he said I don't know whether you realise this but I wrote Smiley about you Wow, that's um, incredible! It was uh, and it was such a big hit for Ronnie Burns. So the three the three pop singers had a hand in that song. <laughs> oh, indeed, and of course, one presumes Smiley was descriptive of you prior to service. Had, had Smiley essentially disappeared on your return? Yeah, 
Yeah. Mm. Well, that's that's right. And there was, uh, you know, it was quite a while um, for me to to. I I got some headway as uh, uh, as a cabaret hack, but uh, you know, if, if if it hadn't been for people, for instance, like Ernie Sigley, who had his show in Adelaide at the time, he gave me. Um, if once a month he'd ring you, what are you doing? Well, still doing not, not much. And he said, um, yeah, well, you better come over and do the show. And he, they'd pay me well. They flew me over. Uh, I'd, I'd do a song. And, and John Crossing, who was the, um, uh, the, the the music director, would give me the charts. So I had some music charts to take back. Uh, I'd pick a song that I wanted to put in my show. And John would give me, after I'd done the show, uh, the the show in Adelaide, he'd give me all the charts and, and it's sort of, if it hadn't have been for Sigley, I think I, I'd have been oh, probably another year or so to get up and running. But, uh, you know, with people who were supportive in the industry, uh, it was it was a great pleasure to be in an industry that had that sort of support. Indeed. And speaking of support, it's going to be very, very different this year on Saturday for Anzac Day as we uh, attempt to get out and, and honour all of those who have served and, and given so much for our freedom. It's going to be very different for everyone across the country, courtesy of Charlie Victor, I guess, strangely enough, mm. uh, and coronavirus. I'm certain that you do every day, but how will you be specifically remembering mates lost in Vietnam and, and those lost after they returned? What will you be doing on the day? Well, for the dawn service, I'm going to set up my PA system, <laughs> and, oh, I, and, and I'll probably play. I might play Kevin Bloody Wilson's service because <laughs> he's got one going out uh, from midnight on Friday night. Yeah. That. So I might play that, but certainly uh, the last post will be heard around my uh, small community, and uh, everybody will understand and know what it's all about. Indeed. Oh, what a privilege that would be to hear. Normally, it, it's largely seen as an Americanism, but I find myself using it more and more. Thank you for your service. I don't think it's an Americanism. I think it's a, it's one we can all use. And but thanks very much for that. And uh, I just hope that all all my brothers and sisters in arms uh, remember their friends, remember their mates, and be in touch with each other. That's the important thing. It's, we can do it by phone. We can call around. And that would be a terrific thing. Even You could even have a house party or a Zoom or one of those sort of things with all your mates at some stage, try and sort it out for the next day or so and then, and then do it on Saturday in the way that you can do stuff in this modern era. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not a distant memory for so many. Um, is the war still there for you every day? Uh, it will never be a distant memory. It'll all, it'll always be there. And somebody said, "What are you doing for Anzac Day?" And I said, "Well, which day?" And they mm. said, "How do you mean?" I said, "Every day for me is Anzac Day because it's not a day that goes by when some sort of ex-service or service uh, issue isn't raised." Indeed, I think that's great words to part on. Normie, thank you so much. It's an absolute honour to speak to you. I cannot express enough how much. Thank you very much for your time today, and and thank you for yours pleasure indeed. We'll look forward to speaking again soon and I'll be thinking of you on Anzac Day along with my kids. Thanks very much, Normie. Right. Thanks, Ron. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.